begins with the prophet Habakkuk. You can get lost in all those minor prophets, you know. There he is, sandwiched between Nahum and Zephaniah. Still lost? A Jonah and the end of the Old Testament sandwiches him as well. Still lost. It's a short book, too, with only three chapters, and it is on page 871 in your Old Testament. This book is so short, it's even classified as an oracle, which the prophet saw. And here it is, Habakkuk 1, 1 through 4. Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen? Or cry of violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack. <coughs> and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. And therefore judgment comes forth perverted. Or in the words of Oliver Hardy, well... Here's another fine mess you've got me into. But Ollie, I didn't mean to get in any mess. And it's like, like pouring one ear into the other. And I don't know what's going on. Well, the fact is, the fact is, the prophet saw what we see every day. Can you help but see it? Just turn on the TV or the radio, look at the internet, and so on. I can't list them all, but I can stimulate your imagination. Chris Christie and the, and the bridge traffic jam, all done because of a political slight. Children starving and dying because of power games in Aleppo. Closer to home, we have men being shot for driving black and policemen who are shot that had nothing to do with the deaths except they wear a uniform. Men, women, and children shot because they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And we cry out, well, here's another fine mess you've gotten us into. We cry violence. Now, the Bible seems to interpret, by the way, violence being violence against the poor. Violence among the poor and the young. Do they vote? Can they vote? Well, let me report. As a chaplain, I once had to counsel an offender because his son was shot. He'd been standing with his friends when a car drove by and some stranger shot him. It was not because he deserved it, but he was shot because he was just standing there. For over an hour, he sat in my office trying to puzzle it out. He was shocked. The prisoner could not understand why his son was dead. The offender said that his son was no choir boy, but nobody deserved to die that way. Two blocks away from my house, three people were murdered. Trains crash in Hoboken. Death is not the only way in which strife and contention rule our world. All over the world, poverty, disease, and suffering rule. We have enough food to feed all of the hungry people of the whole world, but we don't seem to be able to puzzle out how to distribute it. We complain about the state of education in the United States, but we would rather find fault and blame than help. We see what Habakkuk saw, and we are shocked. Justice is perverted because the wicked surround us. Wouldn't it be wonderful if, in order to build an aircraft carrier, we had to have a bake sale? But 
schools were fully funded. We have to face the truth, the truth which Habakkuk is forced to see. The wicked pervert justice, and among those wicked are us. Well, here's another fine mess you've gotten us into. To quote Oliver Hardy in another place, however, why don't you do something to help me? And along comes the Apostle Paul to answer. He writes in 1 Timothy, verses 1 through 14, that's on page 211, I believe, in your pew Bible. He writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God, whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers, night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now, I am sure, lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed, then, of the testimony about our Lord, or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but now has been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and who brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel, I was appointed herald and an apostle and a teacher. And for this reason, I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one whom I have trust and I'm sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. Oh, great, Paul. You suggest that as a cure for the evils that surround us are two old women and a prisoner. Is this the reason why I sometimes open my mouth and my grandmother's voice comes out? Yes, because that's a part of where my faith come from. I remember another discussion between a prisoner and me. I asked him, what would your mother think of your behavior up to now? His response was, she would be ashamed. Do you mean to say that if you had only followed your mother's advice, you wouldn't be here today? That's true. If Timothy followed the advice of Lois and Eunice, he could not go wrong. And if he followed the advice of that prisoner, he would never lose. Wait, wait, think of this again. Timothy is faced with all of the evils with Habakkuk, which Habakkuk saw. Giant issues like death and war, perverted justice. How can he address them? Let's begin at the beginning. You cannot change the world, but you can help the suffering of your neighbor. This is among the best advice of Lois and Eunice. Simple faith worked out among neighbors. You cannot solve the world's huge problems. You cannot, you can say, in some small measure, 
to relieve the suffering of your neighbor. Now, we Americans, we think that we can change the world, and if we can't, then it's our fault. Some of that is the result of why we vote. If we choose the best person, then we can change things. I mean, didn't we win two world wars and become the greatest world power because we voted it so? No! We are not in control of the universe. But follow the advice of Lois and Eunice. Follow the example of Paul, the prisoner. Do not become discouraged or cynical. Let me tell you a story about Millard Fuller. He was a contractor and a builder. Money was rolling in, but his marriage was rolling out. It was falling apart and he could see the corruption of evil around him. When he picked up his wife at a cab, he began to talk to her about how they could work together to help their neighbors. This would not be a radical break in history, just a continuation of their lives together. They would call it, hmm, Habitat for Humanity. That's a nice phrase. The goal was not to change the world, but to help folks build homes. It worked. It held the Fullers together and began the idea of a home for everyone. A small thing with a small goal and human dimensions. Well, what about those big issues then? Those perverted judgment and the violence and those who would sell the poor for a pair of shoes is the spirit of Christ who will prevail. It's that spirit which will be victorious, not the spirit of greed. This is one of those lessons which Jesus taught that nobody mentions. Here's the lesson. You tend to your job and let God do God's work. This is the job for which you were called to love one another and God will accomplish the big things to which we entrusted God in the beginning, the care of the universe, in which God is so much more capable than we are. That being the case, let's pray. God, we entrust to your care our universe. We will try to be faithful to the tasks which your grandma, our grandmothers and our mothers and even prisoners told us, we are more, most important in those goals. We want to love each other just as we are loved by the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.